Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, DREAD 2.0, an enhanced chemogenetic toolkit. I am Julia O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This presentation has been approved for a Category 1 continuing medical education credit by Loma Linda University. If you're interested in obtaining CMEs after attending this presentation, please click on the Get Your Free CME CE Credits button in the bottom left corner of the event screen. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Brian Roth. Brian L. Roth, MD, PhD, is the Michael Hooker Distinguished Professor in the Department of Pharmacology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill Medical School. Dr. Roth has published nearly 400 papers and has given hundreds of invited talks. Among the many honors and awards Dr. Roth has received, he notes his recent election to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. I will now turn it over to Dr. Roth for his presentation. Uh, thank you so much. It's great to uh, thank you so much. It's great to, to have another um, time to present uh, updates on DREAD technology. And what I'd like to do today is uh, briefly give a overview of DREAD technology and then to focus on some recent advances uh, that uh, give us an insights into how this and other chemogenetic technologies could ultimately be used as transformational uh, therapeutic indications for neuropsychiatric diseases. And one of the things I'd like to highlight uh, today is that all of the work that I'm presenting today is supported by the NIH, and in particular, the, uh, this new Brain Initiative grant uh, that we received through the uh, kind generosity of the National Institute of Health. The other thing I'd like to uh, point out is that there will be two Brain Initiative presentations tomorrow one by Walter Korschetz from NINDS, at, both at 3 p.m. Pacific time, and the other by uh, Justin Sanchez from DARPA. And these will be very interesting from uh, a pro programmatic perspective. Now, the background of DREAD and other uh, new interventional technologies uh, for decoding the nervous system come from a, a seminal paper that was uh, published by Francis Crick uh, some years ago. Uh, this was his last uh, major scientific uh, publication. And what he said was needed uh, back then, it was very prescient, uh, was that uh, we needed to do several things to understand how the nervous system worked and ultimately to uh, be able to modulate it for therapeutic purposes. The first was to identify the various neurons and types of neurons that are in the brain. And the other thing that would be needed is some way to turn these neurons on or turn them off in, uh, in freely moving animals in a, um, in a relatively rapid manner. And the, techno the technology that I'm going to present today is, is our approach for doing this. And uh, this uh, idea of, of Cricks was given a huge boost by, uh, by the NIH and uh, the Obama administration, where a new initiative uh, has, has been developed, which proposes tr to transform how we understand the brain. And ultimately, uh, the goal of this is to understand how each neuron in the brain works in an ensemble way in real time to modulate behavior. So with that, by way of background, I want to I want to present how, how we initially <laughs> became interested in this problem now many years ago. Um, but the idea was uh, that if we, could, uh, if we could manipulate neurons, what one way to do this would be to create a, a receptor uh, 
that could be only activated by a small molecule based ligand or chemical actuator that was uh, selected for this engineered receptor. And then uh, our idea was that we could use uh, emerging uh, chemical genetics or genetic technology to put that receptor into distinct uh, neurons in the brain and then to basically turn them on and turn them off with these chemical actuators. So this was, this was our idea. And, and this, was, this is an idea actually that uh, my lab has been working on since the early 90s, I would say, basically without success until um, a brilliant postdoc came into my lab uh, uh, in the early 2000s uh, named Blaine Armbruster. And, and the project I gave him was uh, we, had, we had attempted to do this for many years uh, by engineering uh, receptors uh, to interact with new synthetic ligands. And I thought uh, maybe we could do this in a more efficient way. And perhaps one of the key things would be to start out with a ligand, which was absolutely inert. And so we chose this uh, drug-like molecule, clozapine and oxide, as the ligand for, uh, for these designer receptors. And again, Blaine was the, the person that took on this project. The reason we chose clozapine and oxide was we were really thinking ahead to ultimately translating this technology to primates and to humans. And to do this, we needed a, uh, a chemical actuator which had really good drug-like properties. And clozapine and oxide was the first one, and we thought this would be a great initial, initial tool because it has excellent oral bioavailability, excellent CNS penetrability, and it's safe in humans. Uh, so that ultimately, if, if the technology was useful, we could ultimately translate it to humans. Now, the other thing that we knew about it was that it was pharmacologically inert. And the way we, uh, we decided to uh, create these designer receptors was to use a technology called directed molecular evolution. And we used the uh, model organism yeast as a platform to do this. And this work has been published, you can see the the uh, citations there. And I think a copy of the presentation will be available from, from this group afterwards. But basically we used error prone PCR to generate hundreds of thousands and millions of mutants. Uh, we then, uh, through the power of yeast genetics, basically are able to grow the yeast on media, which contain the chemical actuator that we ultimately wish to evolve the receptor to. Uh, and then uh, we simply look for receptors that, uh, that uh, activate the pathway leading to yeast growth, identify the mutants, um, isolate the plasmids, and then re repeat this. And this is a fairly robust uh, uh, process. We can screen literally millions of mutant yeast uh, within a week uh, by uh, a single uh, highly uh, competent uh, student or postdoc. And so we did this, uh, we used muscarinic receptors as the initial platform because they had previously been shown to work very well in yeast. And uh, we were able to obtain a family of mutant muscarinic receptors that had basically two point mutations in highly conserved uh, residues in the receptor, uh, which you can see here. And these are conserved among all uh, muscarinic receptors all the way from humans all the way down to Drosophila. And so it opened up the, the potential to make families of muscarinic receptors that could be activated by this inert ligand, uh, clozapine and oxide. And in fact, that's what we have done. Um, and they've been validated actually to work uh, in all model organisms as well as all mammalian species, uh, including primates. And uh, to cut a long story very short, uh, what we were able to do initially is to make three flavors of these designer receptors, which we dubbed dreads for designer receptor exclusively activated by designer drugs. One which activates intracellular calcium and leads to burst firing. Another which activates uh, GI coupled receptors, leads to beta gamma mediated inhibition of, uh, of activation of potassium channels, as well as inhibition of uh, neurotransmitter release and leads to very nice neural inhibition. And another one which increases cyclic AMP and modulates signaling. So we call these uh, the GQ, the GI, and the GS DRED. And uh, for further information, you can go to our website, dread.org. Uh, 
all of the plasmids that we have created. Um, uh, are uh, available from AdGene uh, for a nominal fee and uh, viruses uh, that we have made uh, to express the dreads in various brain regions are available from the uh, University of North Carolina uh, Vector Center again for a nominal fee. So we've, we've done a lot basically to put these out into the uh, public domain. Uh, these are all available without uh, material transfer uh, uh, agreements. So what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about uh, uh, each of these and then get on to some new technologies. Uh, so the first one that we characterized in vivo was a GQ dread. We noted that it increased uh, intracellular calcium and suggested that it would induce burst firing in neurons. Um, and these were initially described in a, in a paper we published in neurons some years ago. And the work that we're doing on them now is funded by the Brain Initiative, as I said. Now, what we wanted to do was to in initially validate these in vivo. So we created mice, which would express them uh, under control of an inducible uh, TET-based system. And let me just say here that uh, all of the mice that I'm going to be describing today, as well as uh, newly created uh, conditional dread mice, are all available from Jackson Labs, uh, again, without uh, material transfer uh, agreements to academic labs and nonprofits. So the idea is uh, with the double transgenic mouse, we can use a particular TET driver mouse to get uh, tissue specific expression. Uh, in the absence of tetracycline, this drives the expression of the receptor in a particular uh, region of the brain or body. And then uh, we just inject CNO and this causes some uh, behavior, which we can uh, then uh, monitor. And so the first thing we did was because even though our uh, dreads were expected to be relatively inert, we, we wanted to validate this. We expressed them at extremely high levels using a CAM kinase 2 driver. You can see here, these were studies were done by uh, Sarah Rogan in my lab. We could turn it off with doxycycline um, and uh, they were highly expressed in pyramidal neurons. And you can see here as well, uh, expressed in the apical dendrites of uh, pyramidal neurons, very interesting subcellular distribution. Now, one of the questions that we get frequently uh, is, does basal expression of the dread receptors have any uh, effect on baseline neural firing and baseline uh, behavior? And to date, we haven't, we haven't seen any despite uh, great efforts uh, that we have undertaken uh, to determine if there's a baseline phenotype. They appear to be uh, silent, but, uh, and you can, typically that data is found in the um, uh, supplemental portions of our paper, but uh, for this particular mouse, uh, we did a formal behavioral phenotyping, weight gain, feeding were normal, uh, elevated plus maze was normal. There was a small uh, phenotype in, in open, uh, uh, travel in, in novel environment. Uh, Rotorod was normal, acoustic startle was normal, prepulse inhibition was normal, and so on. In all respects, the mice were completely normal, uh, except when they were given CNO. Um, the other thing is, is uh, because of the increasing number of genetically engineered mice, we get very nice cell-specific expression. Here you can see using a TET driver, we were able to get very good expression in uh, glutamatergic neurons and complete uh, exclusion from uh, GABAergic neurons. Uh, for example, you can see par of albumin neurons here, and here's a, here's a close-up of that. And through the Brain Initiative, again, a number of these uh, genetically engineered mice will be available. And what we found was that uh, CNO induced a uh, relatively robust depolarization in uh, pyramidal neurons. Uh, and, uh, and no effect in control neurons. Uh, this effect was uh, appeared to be mediated by uh, GQ signaling because it was totally blocked by inhibiting phospholipase C. And importantly, what it induced was a tremendous increase in firing of the neurons. So uh, what the GQ dreads do is they induce a, a relatively small uh, but uh, significant increase in uh, depolarization, but then they 
basically prime the neurons to be show an increase in spontaneous firing. So unlike uh, optogenetic uh, technologies, which induce a, a very sort of uh, uh, regular uh, and precisely timed, albeit unnatural firing of the neurons, um, what the what the GQ dread does is it, it basically primes the neuron to increase its spontaneous activity. We uh, further characterize this by multi-electrode array studies in freely moving mice. Uh, these studies were done with George Alexand Georgia Alexander, who's now at NIEHS in her own lab, and Jim Mac McNamara at Duke. And what we found uh, was that uh, there was a, uh, when uh, mice were injected with, uh, with CNO, which was expressed uh, in pyramidal neurons, there was a huge increase in firing. Uh, and in some cases, this, uh, this effect was so large that uh, mice had, uh, had the induction of seizures. So the, the increase in firing was, was very similar to essentially depolarizing the, uh, the hippocampus. Um, the other thing uh, we were able to do was to uh, determine if, uh, if the expression of the dread uh, had any uh, uh, untoward effects on the nervous system. Uh, and so we, because we are uh, using this inducible and reversible uh, TET driven system, we were able to uh, take the mice off, put the mice on doxycycline for about a month period of time and then administer CNO. And what we found in those cases was uh, there was absolutely no effect uh, on firing. Uh, so there's a question, what diseases do the burst firing relate to epilepsy? Yeah, so um, uh, if you express the dread in huge numbers of neurons in the brain, uh, then uh, Basically, what happens is uh, uh, seizures. Uh, if uh, the dread is more uh, uh, sort of uh, tightly expressed in single neuronal populations, which is the typical way that is, that's done, uh, what happens is you basically have an increase of, of neuronal firing, um, which, is, which, which would not be related to any specific disease, but would be uh, similar to a uh, a situation in which uh, you're activating that, uh, that particular pathway. But uh, to get back to these experiments here, um, again, these were, these were control experiments, um, but again, very important controls because they uh, address a number of questions which frequently come up uh, related to DREAD technology, whether the drug clozapine and oxide has any off-target effects. You can see in mice that are on doxycycline where the DREAD is, expression is suppressed, there's absolutely no effect. Um, and the effect of the dread uh, has, uh, has no long-term effects on neuronal function. Uh, and uh, these results then are, are tabulated here. So with that, uh, by way of introduction uh, about the GQ dread, um, what I wanna do is show some specific applications of dread technology and show you how uh, it can be used to deconstruct uh, uh, the activity of ensembles of neurons in the brain and then toward the end of the talk show how uh, dreads potentially could be used in a therapeutic uh, context. And initially what I want to do is focus on uh, the, the problem of the regulation of feeding. Of course, uh, uh, there are a number of diseases uh, related to uh, obesity. Uh, and uh, it would be very, very important sort of going forward to create medications that uh, would be effective anti-obesity agents. Uh, but before we could do this, we what we really want to, want to understand is the neuronal circuitry, which is responsible for regulating uh, feeding. And as recently as four years ago, uh, before the revolution afforded by uh, chemogenetic and optogenetic technology, it was thought that feeding was a very complex motivated behavior uh, and that uh, it, was, it was thought that, that we, would, we would never understand the precise brain regions that are involved in regulating feeding. And, uh, and as well, it was thought that there was no single stimulus of a, of a particular neuronal pathway that could 
uh, trigger feeding behavior with any certainty. Um, what was known from, from sort of the distant past was that there are certain areas of the hypothalamus in particular that when stimulated with electrical stimulation uh, could robustly induce uh, feeding. Thus, uh, stimulation of the uh, medial lateral and, uh, and uh, medial portions of the hypothalamic area typically were, were noted to induce uh, in greatly increased feeding. And it was thought, therefore, that there probably are feeding centers uh, located in neurons in the, hip, in the uh, hypothalamus. However, the, the problem with, with these early studies, uh, which is shown uh, here, is that when neurons are, or neuronal areas are electrically stimulated, you not only uh, activate this green neuron here, which uh, might be responsible for regulating behavior, you also activate the red neuron as well as axons in passage. And because of this, because there was no way to specifically activate a distinct neuronal population before the advent of chemo and optogenetics, uh, it was thought that we would be unable to ever sort of disentangle the various neural contributions to the regulating, regulation of feeding. Um, by way of introduction, it was known that there are certain neuronal populations that were thought to be important for regulating feeding, in particular, the agouti-related peptide neurons in the arcuate nucleus uh, were thought to regulate feeding, but the precise way that they did this was, I would say, completely unknown. So what my lab did in collaboration with uh, Brad Lowell's lab at uh, the NIH or at Harvard using uh, with a extremely talented postdoc of his, Mike Crashes, and uh, my student Sarah Rogan was to make, was first to create uh, viral vectors suitable for interrogating uh, this pathway. So we uh, basically, uh, adopted a technology which had been pioneered by Scott Sternson at Ginelli Labs to use uh, what are called double inverted um, LOXP sites uh, called FLIP or DIO uh, based vectors in which the gene of interest that you want to introduce into a specific neuron is, uh, is uh, put in the vector in the reverse orientation so that under normal circumstances uh, it's not being expressed. And then uh, the viruses are injected into a brain region of a mouse where Cre recombinase is expressed under control of a specific uh, neuron promoter. This causes recombination. And now the expression of the cargo in the sense uh, uh, orientation, and in this case, the dread in the sense orientation, and what we can do is get very nice uh, recombination only in those neurons that are expressing Cre, And this allows for the specific expression of the dread only in this case in agouti-related peptide receptor neurons. And so these experiments were done. Uh, so using an AGRP Cre that was uh, created by Brad Lowell, uh, the dread virus, which was uh, created by Sarah Rogan was injected by Michael Crashes into the region of the arcuate nucleus. And you can see here that only AGRP neurons were expressing um, uh, uh, the dread. And when slices were made, uh, there was this uh, initial depolarization and then this uh, increase in spontaneous uh, electrical activity of the neurons, which, which sort of mimics uh, bursting of neuronal activity by endogenous GQ-coupled receptors. So you get this very nice increase in spontaneous uh, neuronal activity by the GQ dread. And uh, surprisingly, uh, to us, there was this huge increase in spontaneous feeding, which you can see in the red and the other, um, the other lines are basically the controls. And in, a, in about a two hour period of time, a 18 gram mouse uh, was able to uh, increase his, uh, his food intake such that he was uh, taking in about 1.2 grams of food. This would be equivalent to uh, you or I sitting down and, and consuming 10 to 20 pounds of food uh, in, a, in a relatively short period of time. So this is an extremely robust uh, feeding behavior that's, that's activated only by uh, activating those neurons uh, in the, uh, uh, only those AGRP neurons in the uh, arcuate nucleus. 
The other thing that was interesting uh, was that not only was feeding behavior uh, activated, but uh, the motivation to eat was also uh, intensely activated. And that, that could be measured here by looking at the uh, at breakpoint analysis. You can see that, uh, that CNO caused a huge effect in breakpoint analysis, uh, breakpoint or the willingness to feed, uh, willingness to do work to feed. And, and the increase in this was basically equivalent to uh, the motivation to, to eat by a mouse that had been fasted overnight, um, so that there's a huge increase in the willingness to eat as well. Uh, there was a large increase in, um, in spontaneous locomotor activity in mice uh, that did not have free access to food. And so there was this, basically this entire behavioral program that was induced by activating these AGRP neurons and and uh, to us, this was very, very surprising, uh, essentially unprecedented. I note that uh, the Horvath lab has a paper that's in, in press in cell, it's, it's now online, where they basically uh, have replicated this, re this result and, and expanded it to show that there's an even greater uh, repertoire of uh, behaviors that are seemingly activated only by activating those, uh, those particular neurons in the brain. Now at the same, uh, it, additionally, there were uh, relatively large effects of um, large peripheral metabolic effects of activating these neurons, a decrease in whole bo body oxygen consumption and uh, chronic treatment with CNO uh, inducing uh, feeding also led to a large increase in fat mass. So there, there were uh, relatively uh, robust effects, not only on uh, on uh, metabolism acutely, but also chronically, again, only by activating these uh, individual neurons. Again, um, prior to the period these, uh, these studies were done, this, is, this was basically unprecedented and quite novel information, although uh, now I would say uh, two or three years later, relatively routine uh, findings in the literature. Um, so, so what this showed then was that, uh, in fact, the urge to eat, as well as a large number of other motivated behaviors, actually are encoded, appear to be encoded by distinct neuronal populations in the brain. Um, I, I then want to uh, briefly describe the, the, one of the other dreads that we created. This is the uh, GI-based dread, HM4DI, which causes uh, neuronal silencing. You can see, see the uh, 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 whole cell uh, recording here. Again, this can also be expressed in a cell type specific fashion. And uh, using the, the GI dread again in, in these neurons, if you look at the right set of panels, you can see that uh, CNO decreases uh, spontaneous electrical activity of those neurons leads to a decrease in firing. The GQ dread uh, in the middle panel leads to an increase in activity in, increase in firing and increase in eating. And then uh, simultaneously to our paper, uh, a very nice paper by uh, Scott Sternson's lab, Aponte et al., which was published in Nature Neurosciences with optogenetic technologies where um, uh, rather than an increase in spontaneous electrical activity, sort of more physiological uh, uh, way of uh, stimulating uh, neural activity, they used optogenetics have this very nice uh, artificially induced burst of firing. And, but again, uh, regardless of the stimulation, the effect on feeding was, uh, was virtually identical. And that it was nice uh, uh, to basically see this uh, finding that uh, activating these AGRP neurons leads to a robust in increase in feeding uh, with, uh, independently by opto and chemogenetics. Now, now, since then, one of the things that, uh, that I've been very interested in is, and others, others in, the, uh, in the field are interested in, is whether the uh, information encoded by opto or chemogenetic activation or inhibition of neurons is similar or different. And as I said, if we just go back here, one of the, one of the things that's very characteristic of optogenetic stimulation is that it's rapid uh, and it's rapidly reversible, but it's, it's highly artificial. And uh, by contrast, the stimulation afforded with chemogenetic uh, uh, actuators uh, 
is it's more it's more natural type of uh, a stimulation, but it tends to be more prolonged than optogenetic stimulation. So because in one case you you essentially get an asynchronous type of stimulation with chemogenetics and a synchronous type of stimulation with optogenetics, the question has come up as to whether these are conveying different sorts of information to the neurons of interest. And what I've done here is summarized a large number of uh, studies, primarily uh, looking at feeding, although there are some uh, studies also looking at uh, wakefulness, where the same neurons were interrogated uh, sometimes in the same paper, sometimes in different paper, either with optogenetic or chemogenetic technologies. And what you can see in every case is, is, is whether, the, whether the neurons are turned on with chemogenetics or, or with optogenetics or turned off with optogenetics or chemogenetics. The ultimate outcome in terms of the physiology is, is absolutely identical. And I think uh, one of the things that this suggests to me is that the, uh, the frequency of stimulation or inhibition is not so does not appear to be so essential for these particular behaviors as basically whether, whether the neuron is turned on or off. And here are the reference for, references for those uh, papers, for those of you that are, that are interested in, in looking at this. And there are more of these, uh, these papers coming out every day. And as I said, I think these will be available for you to download at the end of the talk. Well, uh, since that time, uh, a huge number of papers have been uh, have been published using both opto and chemogenetic approaches to deconstruct the the circuits involved in feeding, and I've uh, sort of summarized a, a lot of those results here. Uh, and you can see from uh, recent papers where that information uh, might be found. And one of the things that was suggested by this is that uh, GQ coupled receptors, uh, particularly in uh, POMC neurons, so GQ coupled receptor activation would increase POMC neuronal firing, that this would result in decreased feeding. And it turns out, in fact, this is true in that there is a recently approved uh, anti-obesity drug, lorcaserin, which is a selective agent for the 5-HT2C uh, GQ coupled receptor, which decreases feeding. Uh, so this shows how, basically, how one can use this information uh, to uh, either validate or create new uh, new medications for a diverse uh, array of disorders. Um, the other thing that this reminds me to, to make the point of is that one of the, again, one of the nice things about chemogenetic technology is that, is that if you get an effect uh, in the particular circuit that you're looking at, what this, what this implies basically is that, is that all the machinery is, is available in that, in that circuit endogenously to, to mediate that effect because um, the activation is occurring through G-protein coupled receptors. So this has led, so there are, as I'll show you now, many, many of these papers that have been, that have been published. And one of the things that, uh, that we've been wondering is how far this technology can go. And I'm gonna be talking uh, in the rest of the talk about recent uh, studies that have been done by others using chemogenetic technology. So one thing, uh, uh, is that novel dreads might be available. There's a question here. Victoria Tuner, is it known if the firing patterns vary greatly between anatomical areas or within a given area? Is it known which of the two um, stimulation patterns you, you show is more similar to unmodified activity? Um, so this has not been this is a great question. It's not been looked at in any great detail, and uh, I think would be is a is a great thing to look at. I've I've sort of just looked at this uh, looked at this data retrospectively, and have sort of been it's been a little surprising to me that uh, the results from these technologies line up so uh, so perfectly. Um, there is one area in which uh, this might be a difference, and that is with uh, dopamine neurons, where it's been suggested that tonic versus burst firing might uh, encode different sorts of information, but I think this is a this is a great area for further study. Um, but getting back to the talk here, one of the one of the things that we've been very interested in is how far this technology can go. Um, 
the, the overall approach of directed molecular evolution uh, certainly suggests that one could develop dozens of dreads, and this is something my lab is actively engaged in, and we will soon uh, be revealing uh, a novel dread, uh, which is not activated by CNL, although not today, uh, as well as dreads for diverse signaling pathways. One of the nice things about chemogenetic technology is that the chemical actuators are, are highly selective. And so one, one potentially could have hundreds of these in a single mouse. Here's another question. Can you po comment on the possibility that CNO is back metabolized? I'll be getting to that in just a minute, um, if you hold on. Um, the other, uh, so it's not back metabolized in, in rodents. Um, the other question is whether this technology can be used in, uh, in other cells. So there are many papers now using it in other cells, beta, beta cells in the pancreas, astrocytes, neurons as well as for therapies, uh, for example, gene therapy and tissue engineering um, and uh, pre-evaluation of GPCR signaling before drug discovery. So these are, these are areas that we're actively engaged in in thinking about these technologies. Uh, in terms of uh, publications, uh, we appear to be in the growth phase of, uh, of DREAD adoption by the scientific community. Uh, now uh, close to a thousand papers. Yes. Is anything known about GI, GS, GQ dependent modes of intracellular signaling by dreads, e.g. by the beta resting pathway? Um, yes. Um, it appears that uh, the so it appears that the effects that are mediated by the GI, the GQ, and the GS dreads, at least as far as we've been able to determine, are entirely mediated by G protein signaling and not at all by arrestin signaling. Um, although they do activate arrestins to some extent. Uh, we actually have created dreads that only activate arrestin signaling, and uh, some of this has been published and other others of this is, uh, is basically in submission, and it will be interesting to see if if arrest and signaling is specific, but right now it seems like everything that, uh, that we've been able to see so far is directly related to arrest and signaling and more, or G protein signaling and more specifically to whether neuronal firing is increased or decreased. But as I said, uh, we're now sort of in the exponential growth phase here uh, and one or two papers a day basically are coming out using DREAD technology. So it's been highly, highly adopted. What I'd like to do uh, in the last part of the talk is just talk about three uh, therapeutic applications of dreads that have come to my attention. These have all been published by others. These are papers that were published last year. Um, and, uh, and this year, uh, there are multiple papers published in Science, Nature, and Cell using dreads for uh, 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 sort of therapeutic and uh, basic science uh, technologies. And the first, uh, one, of the, one of the approaches is to use dreads to silent seizures. Another is to uh, use them in, in relation to tissue engineering using iPS cell technology. And finally, uh, what I'm not gonna be talking about today, but is, is modulating stroke recovery. And there are many others of these papers. These are just a couple that I decided to highlight today because they were particularly interesting to me. Um, the first thing is this very nice paper that was published by uh, Vinaya Broccoli and others in the Journal of Clinical Investigation. And uh, one of the things I'd like to point out here is that I have nothing to do with these papers. I'm not an author on these papers. Uh, these are just uh, things that have been published by others using uh, the technology we developed. And so this, this is the idea that uh, uh, of course, Parkinson's disease is a uh, devastating disease of catastrophic proportions where dopamine neurons uh, degenerate. Uh, there, there has been uh, the idea around for some time now that one could, uh, through uh, iPS cell technology, create new dopamine neurons, put them back in the brain and reverse the deficits. Uh, the problem with this has been uh, that when the transplanted dopamine neurons are, are put in the brain, they're either too active and induce dyskinesias in the patients or they're not active enough and the, the patients are still uh, symptomatic. 
Well, the idea that, uh, that this group had was, why don't, why don't you put the dreads in the, in the fibroblasts before, or in the, in, in the neuroblasts before they're differentiated into neurons, and then you'd be able to control their activity once they're transplanted. And so that's what they did here uh, when, they, when they had uh, TH reprogrammed cells, they, they put in the dreads, uh, put them in, in the brain. And what they were able to show uh, very nicely was that uh, the neuroblasts, once they were transformed to neurons, uh, uh, the GQ dread increased uh, burst firing, uh, very similar to uh, what, what occurs uh, in slices, and the GI dread basically induced uh, neuronal uh, silencing. And as well, uh, as, you might, as you might guess, uh, when the dopamine neurons show enhanced uh, firing, by uh, GQ signaling, they also show, also show enhanced release of dopamine, both in vitro and in vivo by microdialysis. So here is uh, cyclic voltammetry results in vivo. You can see very nice uh, increase uh, by CNO of in vivo uh, dopamine being released. So they, uh, the dreads work in vivo. And as well, this has functional outcomes uh, on um, on motoric behavior. So they're able to basically decrease the symptoms of Parkinson's disease by uh, decrease by increasing the activity of dopamine neurons or to worsen it. And um, so the significance I think of this going forward is that for uh, tissue engineering uh, projects, uh, what, what one would want to have ideally is some way of uh, gaining remote control over these uh, after they're uh, in the tissue of interest. And a, uh, a very nice way to do this is with chemogenetic technology uh, because basically all you'd have to do is have the person uh, take a pill to either increase or decrease the activity. The other uh, paper I'd like to just briefly describe is this one here uh, published by Kuhlman's uh, uh, group. And this relates to uh, chemogenetic attenuation of, of seizures. Of course, seizure disorders are, um, can be very difficult to control. Uh, and one of the earliest uh, therapeutic applications of DREAD technology is, would likely be uh, in controlling intractable seizures. And basically what they showed was that when the DREAD was uh, expressed uh, in in the area of the brain in which there was a seizure, seizure focus, there was uh, basically, again, a decrease in excitability here, uh, and then a great, a great decrease in spontaneous uh, seizure activity. So this is, this is I think, a pilocarpine-induced seizure. Here you can see the seizure activity on the top. And then in a mouse which were, or a rat that was given a CNO, basically no, uh, no seizure propagation. And so the idea here is that using uh, gene therapy, one could uh, express the inhibitory dread directly in the seizure focus and then basically turn it off uh, uh, with, a, with a small molecule actu actuator. Uh, finally, uh, I'm just going to skip uh, forward a couple because we're, we're sort of running out of time here and I want to get to uh, some of the new uh, chemistry and other technologies that uh, that we've created. I want to uh, talk briefly about um, neuropsychiatric disorders. Uh, this is some unpublished data. And the idea uh, is perhaps we could use uh, this technology for uh, mood disorders. And so uh, a typical uh, idea one might have would be to uh, remotely control serotonergic uh, neurons. And so we again use this, um, this uh, flex-based uh, delivery system. In this case, we're going to be expressing them uh, only in, in the dorsal raphe uh, using mice that create, that ex are expressing Cre recombinase under control of a CERT promoter. Good expression there. In fact, this worked very, very well. You can see here, we were able to get uh, through targeted expression of the dread. Uh, we were able to get expression only in the, in the uh, dorsal raphe. Um, and these were serotonergic neurons. And, uh, and when these were chronically activated, we had a we induced a robust uh, antidepressant uh, phenotype, as measured by a number of um, of outcomes. One is uh, latency to feed, so this is um, novelty suppressed feeding, um, 
was, was suppressed uh, to a highly significant extent. There was a great increase in, as you can see, serotonin uh, neurotransmission based on microdialysis measurements of serotonin, as well as its metabolite 5-HIAA, some effects on, on novel object recognition, actually enhancement of novel object recognition, as well as amelioration of depressive phenotypes in a number of animal models. So again, uh, suggesting that, uh, that one could use this, uh, this technology for therapeutic applications in which specific neuronal populations are, are shown to be altered in a specific disease. Um, as well, we were able to use uh, PET imaging to identify the circuits that, uh, that might be activated or inhibited. Um, and that's shown here. And I have a question here. Let's see what the question is. Desensitization, have you, no, so the question is, have you observed such phenomena following chronic CNO administration desensitization? No, we haven't actually. Um, and uh, if we go back here um, to this paper, to this work here, uh, we actually, uh, I don't have the data here on, in this particular presentation. I guess you have to take my word for it, but um, what we, what we did was we made slices from mice that had been uh, treated with CNO for 45 days. And if anything, there was a slight sensitization. Uh, so the opposite of desensitization. And uh, the reason that this is, is likely because uh, we're in a condition of receptor reserve. We basically have an excess of receptors and they can't uh, be, uh, be desensitized to any, to any great extent. Um, so one of the one of the uh, potential problems with, uh, with CNO in particular is that its effects tend to be relatively long lasting in mice. Another question here. Have dreads been used to interrogate the role of neuronal activity during development? No, um, I'm not aware of any, I'm aware of many people that are doing these experiments. I'm not aware of anybody that's published that the results yet. So one of the problems with CNO is that it has relatively prolonged pharmacokinetics and the effects can be uh, long lasting. Um, the other problem is this uh, question of interconversion of uh, clozapine and oxide in CNO. And uh, so we've gone to great efforts to, uh, to investigate this. Now, one of the things uh, that we found is that in rodents, uh, there is no back metabolism of clozapine to CNO. So we've published this data and it can be found in the, um, in the supplement of this paper here uh, where uh, uh, basically formal pharmacokinetic studies were done with CNO uh, in rodents and CNO and clozapine were measured by uh, uh, LCMS and there basically was no clozapine that was, that was discovered. Um, I get this question a lot and I always like to point out that, that of course we've looked into this and it doesn't occur, but um, at least in rats and mice, it does occur in humans uh, and primates. And so this, this could be a problem going forward. And so what we have done in this data is now published um, it's online now, is we've created a number of uh, peripherally active, both peripherally and centrally active and non-metallizable -met 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 analogs of CNO. And those are shown here uh, and can be found in this paper. Um, and uh, they have, uh, here, here's an interesting one here. Uh, for those of you who are chemists, um, this is a deuterium, uh, uh, analog of CNO and uh, basically uh, is not metabolized because of the, what's called the uh, uh, deuterium isotope effect. So it's, it's not a substrate for the, the SIP because of deuterium there. So interesting bit of chemistry. Um, the other thing we found was that there is an approved drug, uh, perlopine, which is uh, about 10,000 fold uh, selective for the dreads. Um, which is extremely effective at activating uh, the M3 and the M4 dreads. And uh, uh, because it's an approved drug actually could be used uh, for studies of dreads in humans and has no, essentially no active metabolites um, uh, 
and uh, will be very good for going forward as well. These, these particular analogs here uh, will be uh, highly useful and we're making them available to individuals that may be doing studies with primates where the uh, back metabolism of CNO could be a potential problem. Um, the other thing we've done is we've made photoactivated uh, CNO analogs. One of these is shown here um, where you might want precise spatiotemporal control of GPCR signaling both in vitro and in vivo. We haven't, we haven't published these yet, but uh, those will be uh, probably published relatively soon. Finally, um, we thought it would be interesting to have dreads that are targeted to specific neuronal domains. So we and others have made axonally and dendritically targeted uh, dreads, uh, and they work quite well. Uh, and uh, the uh, dendritic targeting dread actually uh, not only targets uh, dreads to the somatodendritic portion, but also targets them to neuronal spines. And uh, we've been thinking it'd be an interesting study to use a photoactivated CNO to activate uh, GPCR signaling in individual spines and see, see what effect that has uh, on overall spine, di spine dynamics and other things. But uh, so we have these and these are also available. Um, and uh, in con uh, combination with photoactivation could achieve millisecond control of signaling uh, in individual spines. And I think this is an unprecedented level of spatial temporal uh, uh, control. Now dreads uh, are, are basically a type of synthetic biology technology. Um, as I said, it, uh, because these allow, these rely on chemical actuators uh, a potentially infinite combination of dreads and small molecules could be, could be developed. And uh, thanks to the BRAIN initiative, this is, this is something we're undertaking uh, right now, uh, approaches to uh, create large numbers of dreads, perhaps hundreds of different uh, dread chemical actuator uh, combinations. And one can imagine then uh, being able to interrogate hundreds of different neural subtypes uh, sequentially uh, in attack, in intact, uh, freely moving animals, and that would be uh, truly something that can't be done with any other technology, any other technological platform. Could never be done optically. Um, and so we can take advantage of of chemistry for that for that purpose. Um, if I if I can just go back here, I have a couple of minutes. Um, the other the other thing that is making this possible is the revolution. Uh, that's currently going on in GPCR structural biology, which my lab has a part in. Now, um, the other thing that's nice about the technologies is dreads reveal the pathways responsible for modulating neural signaling. As I said, uh, if a dread causes an effect in that neuron, it's likely that there's a GPCR there that's druggable that also does the same thing. Um, they're also equally useful in non-neural cells. There are now dozens and dozens of papers uh, showing this. Uh, and they have the potential for therapeutics. I, I showed you seizures, iPS cell-based therapeutics, and uh, potentially in neuropsychiatric disorders. Uh, and so the idea is that, uh, that this technology will allow us to uh, gain uh, a detailed understanding of uh, circuits uh, in the brain that are responsible for neuropsychiatric disorders. And that uh, ultimately, when the brain initiative is successful, uh, we will understand the circuits and the particular circuitry derived alterations that are, that are responsible for many, many diseases for which we currently have no treatments. And, and the idea is that we'll be able to intervene in those diseases in a therapeutic way using, uh, using chemogenetic technology. So that's, that's the idea. So I wanna thank the various people that, uh, that have, have been involved in this work uh, Blaine Armbruster uh, currently is at Merck Sereno. E. Alvardi, who has created a new dread, unfortunately didn't have time to talk about that today, but uh, I'm informed that it's, it's in press in Neuron, so it should be coming out soon. Uh, he's now at Merck. Sarah Rogan, uh, now at UTMB, and Dan Urban, who's now at NCATS at the NIH. And of course, Jim uh, McNamara at Duke, George Alexander, Brad Lowell at Harvard, and Mike Crashes, who now has his own lab at NIH. 
and as well the funding agencies. So all the all the work that's currently ongoing in my lab related to dreads is funded by the the NIH Brain Initiative. I thank them very much for this. Um, and the key initial funding for the dread technology was actually obtained by NARSAD. Uh, they gave me the initial grant that allowed us to develop the initial grants and then uh, subsequently this work has been funded by the NIH. So we have about uh, four and a half minutes left. Um, I think I've answered all the questions. Uh, if there are uh, any other questions, we have a few minutes um, to go. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to answer anything else or if you felt the answers that I gave were not sufficient. Um, the other thing that I'd just like to mention is that um, I have a blog here. Let me just give you the address of the blog here. Just copying it here. I can, here's a question. Do dreads interact with other GPCRs to form heterodimers? No, they don't, uh, as far as we know. So this is something um, we've spent uh, a fair amount of time looking at, at least nothing that we can validate. Um, so it's a question I get a lot. Um, as far as we know, no. Other people have published. Uh, uh, very nice study has was done uh, by uh, Graham Milligan, which has published published two papers, one in Molecular Farm, the other in JVC, basically negative data. So, um, so as far as we know, no, and uh, uh, that's all we know. Yes, other question here. Are you inducing glutamate receptor to induce GQ signaling in pyramidal neurons? No, probably not. Uh, this is likely uh, through the PI, through um, uh, alteration of phosphonostide signaling. Another question, have you done any work looking at what the actions of dreads on GS glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta? We haven't. We haven't looked at that pathway. Great question, though. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm sending the blog uh, to the organizers here, and I would ask them that they post this with my talk. Uh, I get lots of questions related to dread technology, and I usually put the answers on the blog. Um, so if any questions should come up uh, after the talk today or those of you that are working with threads, if you have questions, you can just go to the blog and, and there are the answers. Okay. Is there any immune response to dreads that could be problematic in their application to gene therapy? Uh, no, not that we know of. And we've looked at this um, and uh, uh, we haven't seen any immunological response in any rodents um, and or in uh, uh, we've also looked in um, in monkeys. So a number of people have used dread technology in monkeys and we specifically looked for evidence of any uh, untoward immuno uh, reactive effect and there aren't any, um, uh, likely because these are human receptors. Uh, so you wouldn't expect them to, it's not like we're using a bacterial product. Okay. But great question. Click on the whiteboard. So I did this, the text tool. Yeah. Okay. Other question here. Has anyone evaluated how robust DI is against preventing spike to less, uh, spiking elicited by optogenetic input? Yeah, there are lots of papers on this. Um, um, uh, the best paper is actually 
a paper by Scott Sternson that was published in Neuron last year uh, where they uh, looked at um, uh, spiking and release. Uh, and I, my lab, I wrote a, um, a little perspective on it. So if you uh, go to Scott Sternson's paper, that's probably the best for that. All right, so we're out of time. So thank you very much. And I'm going to leave. Bye. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I want to thank the audience for their interesting questions and participation in today's event, and our speaker, Dr. Brian Roth, for his informative presentation. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing for several months following. You'll receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time. Goodbye.